welcome to all of you who are joining us. I um, hope you've managed to have a cup of tea after that football match. We are Sea Changes and we're celebrating 10 years since our foundation with a festival of events. This evening is the penultimate event, but one I've been looking forward to for several months now. I'm so lucky to be involved with the festival. I got the pick of the bunch of all the events interviewing our very special guests this evening. My name is Miranda Kristovnikov. I'm a diver and wildlife presenter and supporter of Sea Changes. Now the film that you just saw summarises about a little bit about what Sea Changes has been doing over the last decade. By giving out small grants to really worthy causes, they've enabled over 200 marine conservation projects to happen around the UK. I've got a personal interest in this wonderful organisation as some of the projects I've been involved with and some that I've filmed in my career have been ones that have been funded by Sea Changes grants. Sea Changes would like to thank, uh, say a big thank you to Extreme Ice Cream for sponsoring the festival and making it possible. Extreme is one of Sea Changes' newest business partners and they're they are funding a Tackling Oceans Plastics Fund as part of Sea Changes' main grant fund this August. So if you know of a project that would benefit, please do let us know about it. Just to remind you all that this evening is completely free, but we'd really love it if you feel that you could show your appreciation by making a donation, however small, via Just Giving. The money raised will go towards Sea Changes main grants programme and the links will be posted in the chat box. Um, also, just to remind you that we've got a range of festival t-shirts and hoodies that are available to buy via T-Mill and these will also raise money for Sea Changes. The link again will be posted in the chat. So there's your starter and now for the main course which is definitely fish is on the menu tonight I'd like to introduce our very special guest this evening author of many books including the new newly released and rather brilliant The Brilliant Abyss. Helen Scales is not just an author though she's a marine biologist and a broadcaster and science advisor for Sea Changes. Now Helen will be taking questions at the end so fee please feel free to use the Q&A box throughout so we'll try and answer as many of those as we can. I had a little peek at her website um, and there she describes herself as a person combining a scuba diver's devotion to exploring the oceans, a scientist's nerdy attention to detail, a conservationist's angst about the state of the planet and a storyteller's obsession with words and ideas. So Helen, welcome this evening. Thank you so much, Miranda, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for joining us this evening. And I hope you are all uh, excited about the football, but excited to know more about the oceans as well. Yeah, I just knit next door to get a quick update and make sure that it all finished so we could uh, actually start the event. We're good, yeah. yeah. And how, how are you, Helen? How's the, how are things going? Really good, thank you. Yes, I um, mean, rather missing the ocean at this point of uh, of the pandemic. I'm um, rather hoping I'm going to get back soon. Um, but no, I think n cannot complain. It's been it's been fine here. I hope the same with you. You're yeah. by the coast, aren't you? Mm, well, if Bristol's by the coast, I don't think it really is. Closer think... than Cambridge, at yeah. least. Well, yeah, I think it's closer than Cambridge. Yeah. Because you actually have a base out um, on the Atlantic coast in France. So how have you, have you managed at all to get out there in the last year or so? Um, we were there last summer, which was really wonderful. And we were really lucky to be there then. And um, we are hoping, uh, I've just had my second jab and that all went well. So hoping to get back there soon um, to, yeah, to go and get uh, some more vitamin C. Oh, ha, ha. Uh, but yeah, need to, need to be back by the ocean for, for some more, more of that. So hopefully soon, yeah. And is it really important for you to be by the sea? Are you one of these people who needs to see the sea every day to sort of feel comfortable? Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. And, and the longer I'm away, the, the, the worse it gets, really. Um, so, yeah, that was what uh, what drew us to that part of the, the wild part of France was some... Uh, I mean, it's, it feels very much like Cornwall where we are. It's, it's kind of big wild cliffs and, uh, and cold, uh, wavy ocean and, and lots of wonderful stuff in the ocean, in the water as well. So I jump in and uh, put my mask on and go free diving and see what's there. So, I mean, that just, I mean, I guess it, it just feels like an absolute treat to be able to spend part of my, my time and to go there to write and to, um, to be by the ocean and to be inspired to be there. Uh, and, um, and yeah, at least sort of it kind of tops you up, I guess, that you take, I take it with me back, back to the, to the landlocked uh, Cambridgeshire where I am now and um, it keeps me going for a while, but I am running pretty low to, at this point, I have to say, because it was, it was months ago we were there last. <laughs> so this love affair, this obsession that you have with, with the oceans, where did that all start? Was it when you learned to scuba dive as a teenager or was it way before then? 
I think the I think the um, the seeds were sown before the diving, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But uh, yeah, I mean, I grew up in in Surrey again, kind of landlocked um, county in Britain. But but I was very lucky that uh, my family had a, a little. Um, a little stone cottage down in Cornwall on the edge of Bodmin Moor and we would go there pretty much every holiday um, we'd all get, climb in the car and drive down to Cornwall and we had both coasts at our kind of fingertips really the north and the south coast and so it was just really normal for me to be there and so I think that really that part of the Atlantic as well just got into my blood at a very early age and I mean I just loved being outdoors generally was a sort of just general sort of nature kid running around in the woods or on the beach or wherever it might be um, but clearly the the sea and the coast was was always my favorite place to be um, and that that sort of started at that young age and then yeah I was in my teens um, and that's when I scuba dived for the first time in a swimming pool was the first dive I did um, in Surrey um, yeah. even that was enough to um, convince me that this was a, a very extraordinary physical experience of being able to breathe underwater and, and even just in like literally this much of water in a swimming pool you're still just your mind is blown by the fact that you can breathe um and I love that um just from the very first you know the very first time I put my head under the water I've absolutely uh, absolutely loved it and then when I got into the open water and and saw my first wild fish then I was completely completely hooked immediately because I had this sense of of being sort of in the aquarium like the wall the glass wall had fallen away and I was in the, the world this three-dimensional world of the fish around me and uh, and I just wanted to spend I just wanted to stay there and chase after these animals and learn more about them and and sort of see what lives they live in this very different um this very different world you're floating around um you know you've got three dimensions to play with um so I was, I was utterly hooked from that first open water dive and I think from then on I was just basically an excuse for me to do whatever I could to stay in the ocean as much as I could. And where was that dive? Was that in the UK or were you abroad? It, yeah it was, it was, it was actually it, the first first dive wasn't even in the ocean it was in it was in Stony Cove so if there's any divers in the in the audience who know Stony Cove you'll know the pain I've been through as well in March I should say it was March uh, about four degrees um, uh, was the water temperature and I was in a they call it a semi-dry suit but I'm not quite sure what was dry about mine I was so okay. cold um, uh, it all seemed like a very bad idea for a little bit and then you get used to it and you see the wildlife and um, and that's when it all all makes sense to me. But then after that, I did um, I dived in Cornwall for a couple of years. That was the first sort of two years of my diving uh, was down in the southwest. And so I explored shipwrecks and reefs and amazing life down there, which um, which puts you in good stead as a diver as well. I think diving in the UK because it's yeah. you know it is a challenge physically. You've got you've got to figure out um, protecting yourself from the cold and um, the weather isn't always quite that kind um but but the rewards are huge I mean and you know this of course but what we can see around the British Isles is just extraordinary and um and it's uh, it really is a it's it's this kind of hidden secret around the edges of our island really that that's all this wonderful life is down there yeah. and jumping in and being by it was just it's just been wonderful yeah I find it I don't know about you but I find it quite hard to describe to a non-diver just how incredible it is to be underwater to be able to breathe underwater and have this feeling of weightlessness yeah um, sure we've got divers and non-divers in the audience this evening but is there a way that you use to, to, to describe how mesmerizing it is and how you know when you went when you get in the water you literally just don't want to get out because this whole party going on out there <laughs> yes. there are these fish doing really cool things and you just don't want to get out the moment you're in yeah it's like it is it's like entering another world because you've got that physical difference of um yeah you're kind of you're effectively leaving gravity behind if you're you know you're floating around hopefully if you've got your buoyancy in a good state you can have that neutral feeling of just floating um and and yeah the waterline really just does feel like this interface between two worlds and you once you're below it and you're in that world you're completely you are completely immersed i mean it is immersion it, of all of your senses you know physically you can, you're hearing very differently um, one thing I find about diving is it's, I find it incredibly meditative because um, I, I mean, I've never been diving with um, uh, with full face mask where you've got communication. So I'm always got the thing in my mouth, so I can't say anything and you can't communicate with words, you, but you can communicate with. Or do you have gestures, of course, like, are you OK? Should we go up? That kind of thing. But mostly it's just like sharing with your dive buddies that moment. It's kind of this wordless um just sharing of this environment it's like imagine going for well okay imagine going for a hike for your through a beautiful forest filled with animals and you can't speak to your friends but you can just share it and enjoy it together 
And if you want to, you can just glide up to the canopy, come back down again, go anywhere you want in that three dimensional space. That's kind of what it's like diving and full, full of creatures just pouring through or little things that you can look at closely. And, you know, everywhere you look, there's something wonderful. But there's something about the intimacy of just it's quiet and you just have to look and think and you're, it's sort of all in your mind as well. I love that with diving. You can hear your breathing and your breathing slows yeah. down and relax and everything slows mm. down. Yes. You know, oh, I want to be there yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> Um, I read that um, you've never dived through a kelp forest, you've never dived with a whale, and you've never dived under the ice. If you had to choose to do one of those, which one would it be? I was thinking about this, actually. I, I have, I guess I haven't, I have dived on kind of kelpy. I've since, since I wrote that, I have dived in, in kelp ecosystems, but not those really tall, towering, um, giant kelp forests. I would still love to do that. But if I had to choose, well, can I have a whale under the ice? Is that choosing? <laughs> um, I mean, they would all be wonderful. I, perhaps actually, okay, I would love to go to Antarctica and dive under the ice there. Um, whether that will ever happen, obviously, it's an extraordinarily extreme and, and bizarre place um, to be and, and challenging and so on. But if that opportunity ever came along, that would be for me, I think that would be the standout thing because the life it, Antarctica looks you know it is so different again beneath the waves and above the waves you've got this icy white world above and this incredibly rich ecosystem and that on the seabed and in the open water of Antarctica um uh, so I'd really love to see that that would be amazing and are you okay dealing with the cold because it's just I've been ice diving once and 20 minutes in the water and you just want to get out and everything's freezing cold and okay yeah I mean I'm sort of assuming if I have a really good dry suit yeah okay um but we'll have to see <laughs> yeah I'll see how it goes yeah. I'll take my chance um so uh I wanted to ask what the what role of um a, a marine a deep sea marine biologist actually uh, sort of involves from day to day what's your what's your day-to-day -day job we'll talk about your role in sea changes in just a minute mm. um up yeah. in Cape, what, what do you actually do well I have a bit of a strange mixture of things really because I spend um a fair amount of my time uh actually working on books and uh, and talking to a lot of other scientists so sort of I, f I find myself kind of in this place of being um, uh, the science sort of happening and, and I often get to go and work with scientists doing lots of different projects so for me it really depends on, on what I'm working on at the time whether I'm sitting at home uh, composing books writing ideas down or whether I'm out in the field um so I think I guess and I think that's quite similar for whatever field of whatever way marine scientists work um it really depends you know if you're in a period of field work then you're generally especially for deep sea scientists generally completely immersed in that world as well because chances are you'll be on a ship for a number of days weeks or even months and then it's just just 24 7 science basically well science and sleeping and eating basically which some would argue is pretty much ideal to be honest um as a, as a way of passing time um so it's kind of you kind of shift you shift really from sort of this is when you know the field science is happening so in terms of deep sea science a lot of that is um, involving a lot of really wonderful um, technical equipment. It's it's um, getting that sort of things like amazing submersibles into the water. Um, often the biologists like myself aren't actually doing that side of things. There are technical teams, there are engineers who are doing that, but we're sort of watching on and guiding and 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 then eventually kind of guiding those machines in the, in the deep ocean. So I mean, just as an example, like a day at out at sea, um, the, the you know the submersibles will go down first thing usually. That'll take a long time to get to the bottom of the ocean. I was the last trip I was on was in the Gulf of Mexico. We were working in about two thousand meters of water, and it took an hour for the machinery to get down to that that bottom. So, so the day is quite punctuated. You kind of you 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 sort of you launch this enormous. It's like the size of a car. It's a deep diving robot basically. No one's on board. This a lot a lot of the stuff is remotely operated, and ours were. You sort of get this huge thing crane and it's sort of, uh, craned and dropped into the water, and then and down it goes. And then you kind of just wander off and go and get coffee and or go and finish off what you were doing in the lab um, and, and wait for it to get sort of the exciting stuff to start, which is when it reaches the bottom, which is what we were working on was the abyssal planes. Um, and and then, you know, you kind of going in teams basically to guide the, the, the science that's happening. And, and, and it's sort of this weird thing in your head of like it's all happening 2000 meters beneath your feet uh, and, it, and you watch the TV screens and it could just be on it could be on another planet. It, it really feels like you could be kind of, you know, 
broadcasting this you know into the into the universe but but it's just it's down beneath your feet and um you know and that's how the science is done a lot of it is done through this sort of remote technology you're kind of putting things down taking things back up and, and it all takes time for things to happen um and then you know there are sort of periods of calm and then periods of frantic science that happen um and i love that set I, working on ships is a really um a really privileged part of doing this kind of science because you are completely immersed in 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 answering questions and um, sort of solving problems that come up and and you're working in a team and, and it's always a big interdisciplinary team too it's always you know a mixture of chemists and usually biologists and engineers and physicists all kind of putting their minds to this question of how does the deep work in, in particular ways and that's a, a, a hugely exciting part of it. And then there's boring parts as well when you get back and you've got to sit at your computer and write, write or you know, crunch data and that kind of thing too. So, um, so I, think, I think any kind of scientist finds their life is really sort of some, you know, depending on what time of the year, whether you're teaching, whether you're doing the science, whether you're analyzing, writing papers and so on, it really does vary. And um, which, you know, it's just, it's just fun, a fun part of it too, that you get to do lots of different things. But as a diver, um, I would, I think I would be quite frustrated that I couldn't be down there diving, that I'm having to use all this tech and, and robots to do the, the job for me. And also, um, you know, as a diver, you, you know, you're used to exploring shallow seas, which are very colourful and plentiful, um, yet you've decided to leave all that behind and go and explore the deep. What, why was that? Why, why didn't you just sort of take the easy road and just decide to do the surface stuff? <laughs> well, I mean, I have, I did all that. I have done all that too. And I think, I think over time for me at least i had this kind of deepening interest in the ocean for various reasons i think i mean it is yeah it was the diving that got me into all of this in the first place and and um and you know i've done a, been very lucky to have been to lots of amazing places and and dived and, and been in the shallow seas but i guess for me there was just this sense of of well the the most exciting science and discoveries i i think are taking place in the deep ocean because we've got these kinds of technologies and you, you do have to kind of put yourself aside most of the time and say well you know i'm not the one going to be going there there are some some submersibles that take humans down but even then you're behind a glass wall and you're in this kind of basically a metal ball um, i've not done that but I, and i would if i had the opportunity for sure even though i'm a bit claustrophobic i think i'd have a bit of problems with it but i would do it anyway um uh, but you know, it is a different sensation than you know. You're not you're not immersing yourself as you are as a diver, uh, scuba diver. Um, but but what you get to see in the worlds you get to experience are so completely different. I mean, basically, for, for like the large majority of the time when anyone is doing science in the deep sea. Um, exploring the deep ocean, you're going to places that no one has ever seen before. Genuinely, no one has looked at that piece of the planet before, and that is just so exciting. And, and it's not just all the same. There's so much variety and there's so much that is being discovered in the deep ocean. I mean, it's more or less you just kind of open your eyes out or, you know, put the, turn the cameras on and you'll see something that no one, not only a place that no one has seen before, but it, probably organisms that haven't been seen before or certainly behaviors. Um, it's just, it kind of, it just feels all new and all very important that we're sort of pushing together these pieces of how this vast ecosystem works. We're talking about 95% of the living space on our planet is the deep ocean, of the biosphere is the deep ocean. And we're still just kind of getting to know what's there and how it's all connected and why it all matters. Um, and, you know, not to say that that's not the case in the shallow seas, but they are much better known. We do have many more people have studied the shallow seas for so much longer that we have got a much better idea of what's there. And, and the deep ocean just needs us sort of drawing us down there. I think I just had this sense of this is where this is where science is the most exciting at the moment, I think. So you, you, I think you mentioned that you are only one of about 500, am I right, deep sea biologists? That was like a guess I had, basically. I kind of had asked around and I was like, well, you know, how many, to, to, to other deep sea biologists, like, you know, how many people do you think would identify themselves as full-time deep sea biologists? And that was a sort of rough number we came up with. Um, it's basically not that many. And I have no idea how many coral reef scientists there are or fishery scientists, but I'm assuming it's thousands maybe tens of thousands yeah and understandably so i mean it is it's easier to study those parts of the ocean there's other reasons why that you know there's it is it's it's more appealing in some ways but yeah i think and if you i, I worked out that if you then divided up the ocean the deep ocean between those 500 people i think yeah. i came up with it something like 20 million cubic yeah. miles or something each like ridiculously we don't do it that way it's not like here's your bit yeah. you can see what's there <laughs> it's your bit but if we did um it's just unthinkably big sizes and volumes that we're talking about in the deep ocean um so the more deep sea 
research is done, I think the better, really, the more people want to get into it, whether that's biologists, physicists, oceanographers of all sorts of varieties, the better, I think. Yeah. It sort of begs the question, why aren't there more people wanting to study it? If it's so vast, there's so much out there that we don't know about. Is that lack of funding or just... Um, it could be, yeah. I'm not sure if it's, again, a kind of... I think we are in this kind of golden age of deep sea science, and I wouldn't be surprised if we're kind of on the beginning of a wave of more people wanting to do this. I mean, generally, sort of marine biology is um, is a really bl blossoming field, and there are a lot of people who want to go into it. Understandably, it is the best part of the planet, and you know, quite recommend it as the best type of science to do, whether it's shallow or deep. And I guess, and maybe it's partly this idea of a lot of people do want to be in the ocean themselves. I mean, that's how I started out, as we've said, you know, I started out diving and wanting to be there, and I still do very much. And maybe there's a sense that you're not going to get to do that. And I think until you really understand or have experience or know someone who tells you about what it's like to work on ships and um, these big research ships that go out, and even if you've got to stay on the ship, and that is that is frustrating, you still get to see into these worlds in ways that is just extraordinary. Um, you're like this kind of remote explorer of the planet. Um, so maybe that will catch on, but it is, I mean, you need a lot of money. It is, it's high price, it's high ticket um, science compared to, you know, anything else anything else really um you know it, it does require big projects it requires a lot of planning in advance um it's not the kind of thing you can just sort of jump in a you know jump in a boat and off you go and jump in the water um so it's different you know it is different um and i think we need more money dedicated to that you know look at the difference between how much money is spent on space exploration of outer space and how much is spent on inner space in our deep seas and i think that needs to be balanced up as well as we're understanding just how important the deep is for uh, for the functioning and the health of the whole planet we really need to understand that as much as possible and there's some amazing science happening it's just more of it needs to happen and we need more money and more more excitement about this place so before we go into the book in in more detail i just want to um talk about your relationship with sea, sea changes um your scientific sorry lost the words this evening scientific advisor to sea changes what does that actually involve on a day-to-day -day basis and are there any pr projects that you're really looking forward to that we've got lined up you know, yeah, so I I got involved with Sea Changes really early on, and I'm so thrilled that um, that Helen and Rachel kind of got in touch and said, "Would I would I like to kind of play a part in this initiative that they had? This great idea of of helping to to find ways of of you know getting these funds out to people doing projects." And you know, I leapt on the opportunity to, to get involved, and I basically said, "Well, look." I'd like to help decide who the money goes to, um, you know, and so we've got a panel, uh, a grants panel, myself and several other wonderful people who um, basically periodically, um, when the grants come in, we get to look at them all, or if, um, if there's loads of them, then we divide them up between us. And we basically read them through really carefully and um, think carefully about which ones fit the criteria most of um, sea changes, um, which excite us the most, uh, which kind of which which are the ones we want to put our money to. And I, you know, I tend to focus on the scientific projects, but obviously I read I read all of them and um, see this amazing um, sort of suite of different approaches that that people across the country are taking to to helping the seas. And I, I, I without fail in all the years I've been doing this, I can't every single time this happens, I am always uplifted by this whole process. Every time I open these the folders and I look at the projects, I'm always just just reminded like how at how many wonderful people are putting so much effort and so much creative thought into how to study the oceans, how to protect the seas around Britain. Um, I you know, I'm always, I always finish it. But first of all, not really knowing how to decide because they're all most of them are always fabulous. So it's really hard to choose. Um, but just so enthused that this is a, that these sorts of projects are happening. You know, we see it, this kind of breaking down of boundaries between science and art and showing that all of these different things need to happen, you know, from monitoring pollution to monitoring particular species to communication. You know, that's such a big important part of what sea changes do is support projects which are getting the word out, getting people involved, no matter how old they are, no matter what background they come from, but connecting them to the seas in different ways. And it's it's such a wonderful, rich ecosystem of projects. It's always wonderful. So it's hard to pick any out, but um, I mean, a couple that I've really 
I really love like two sides of things, I suppose, like the, the really creative projects that are communicating what's going on and, and getting people to the coast. Those are all absolutely wonderful. But then there are some really wonderful practical solutions too, like um, putting drinking uh, re water refill stations around the coast so that people can visit the beach and not, not have to bring plastic bottles. And it's such a practical, simple, but re really effective way of cutting down on that sort of that aspect of, of the problems of plastic pollution. And I love that. Um, and just in this latest round, we've had some really exciting um science um uh some getting people involved in science in different ways um, i love the there's a project in orkney the orkney marine mammal research initiative is training residents in orkney to help um in these uh, marine mammal monitoring projects so getting just non-scientists just just um average anyone who's interested can come along and learn how to really t get involved in these citizen science, pro science projects with really great effects of you know having more eyes out there collecting information about what's what's out in the seas um, and then through to some fantastic, you know, just full on science is happening too. They're mapping um, the historic herring spawning grounds in the Berwickshire coastline. Who knew there used to be these incredibly rich fisheries up there and they've sort of faded away, but now we want to know if they're coming back. And so that's, yeah, that's what I love about sea changes that we can be putting money into fantastic science, citizen science, um, practical solutions as well to, to the issues that the seas face. And um, in, it's, yeah, always a huge, huge inspiration. And I'm very excited each time around to see what new things are coming up and which old friends are also coming back for some, some more support. It's great. It's so encouraging to hear so many positive stories as well. So, so much that we hear about the marine environment is very negative, you know, overfishing exactly. and that sort of thing. It's lovely to hear your mm. energy enthusiasm about some really positive news and positive projects and moves yeah. forward so that's that's great great news um so back to my back to my list of questions and actually back towards the, the book as well um have, have you got a, a particularly um a, a particular sort of highlight of an animal that you, you you've been particularly fascinated by people always ask me what my favorite animal is my favorite bird so it's not that question but is it an animal that you've studied um, that you're particularly mesmerized or fascinated by its biology because reading through the book um, I mean you start off by describing the deep and describing some of the, the incredibly bizarre creatures in the deep and it's almost like you, you've made them up you know, you've got the, the hairy hoff crabs you've got headless chicken monsters you've got the ostidax worm I mean that was one that really fascinated me um, discovered on the body of a dead whale what is it 300 meters 3000 meters down in Monterey Bay um, it's got feathery tentacles, it's got green branching roots, it's got no mouth, no anus, um, it, no guts. I mean, it just is bizarre. And it, but it would seem like every animal that I was reading about in your book was more bizarre and, and more incredible. But is there one that fascinates you more than any of the others, maybe? I can't say there's one, I think. It is, re I mean, basically everything in the deep is, is very strange and wonderful. And, and what I love about it is that, it, but it makes sense. Like the, the orthodox worms make sense when you learn about, well, they're eating bones of vertebrates, straight whales and things that fall down. And But they've evolved ways in which that is a way of actually existing and thriving in the deep. And it's completely improbable, but the evolution has made it happen. And I love that. Um, so it's very hard to pick one out. But I think what I like, I think what I like the most, uh, what I find the most, fascinating and eye-opening are those animals that really open our minds to other animals and how they live and then sort of the idea of what an animal can be um and i mean for me it's things well especially ones that bring very alien strange like looking things closer to us i mean this is such a sort of tendency for us to assume that humans are the smart ones, that the only way to be have a complex, interesting life is to be a hairy mammal crawling, walking around on land. And then you see what's happening in the oceans and look at things like things like the Humboldt squid, these incredible animals. They're six foot long, great big squid that swim around in the twilight zone around a, down to a thousand meters and chasing after these shoals of beautiful, sh shining lantern fish that have their own lights. Um, and it's recently been discovered, some studies, um, again, off the California coast, I think, of showing um, that, well, the question was, I guess it's sort of like the question leads to an interesting answer. The question is, well, how do these things hunt? They hunt in packs, these enormous squid, kind of huge shoals of them hunting after these fish. And how do they do that in the dark without bumping into each other? Um, the answer seems to be that maybe they talk to each other with patterns on their bodies that themselves are illuminated. We think they've got this bioluminescence in their skin. So it's like a kind of a, a, a computer screen shining out in the dark. And they have and films 
uh, film of uh, footage of these animals, um, hours and hours of footage um, of them hunting. And um, scientists have kind of gone through and sort of looked really carefully at what's going on and shown, well, actually, they have these different patterns of like combinations of stripes and spots and sort of dark face and uh, pale body or stripes on the body, um, you know, pale tentacles and all these sorts of different combinations, which maybe seem to have some kind of communication. It, it could be a language, maybe. We don't yet know. We don't know what they're saying to each other. We think it could be, excuse me, that's my fish. Leave that one alone. Um, please don't bump into me. But there's something going on. And that's why I think I find it the most fascinating. It's like, what's happening? What are, the, what are they saying to each other? Um, and why not? Why not? They are incredibly intelligent animals. Again, it's no, just because they're not humans, just because they're not mammals, doesn't mean they're not smart. But they're a very different type of smart. You know, it is almost like aliens uh, on, on our planet. It's a different evolutionary path towards intelligence. And that is telling us so much about life on Earth. Um, so, yeah, things like that. I, lo I love that. It just opens a window that we don't quite understand, but it's something different and it's shocking and, and fascinating about how life works and how animals live their lives. So, as I said, with the book, you get us to fall in love with the, with the deep. I mean, the first half of the book is all this, this wonderful description of these incredible habitats and incredible creatures. And you just, you know, it's, it's just, uh, you are mesmerised by, by the, the descriptions. And then you go on to discuss the various challenges, the, the many, many challenges facing the marine environment, which seem too numerous and too overwhelming. I mean, I, for one, feel very powerless when I hear about oil spills and islands of plastics and overfishing. Are there, I mean, you were talking very positively about Sea Changes projects. You know, what challenges are there out there that we as individuals can actually feel we're able to do something meaningful about? Let's have some positive news. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree. I, I suffer from that, too. You look at the, the huge threats to the ocean and the planet as a whole. You know, we have these big, big, overwhelming issues that have to be dealt with. We've got climate change. We've got overfishing. Uh, we've got ocean acidification. We've got plastic pollution, all these huge things, which are these big, dispersed, difficult problems to deal with. Um, but I think also at the same time, the reason I, the, you know, the sort of the hopes I have and, and the days when I'm feeling much more positive is when I when I remember that I'm not the only one that feels this way and that we uh, that that caring about the ocean, I think, has become kind of mainstream as well. Like it's not just marine biologists. It's not just um, you know, those of us who get to go diving and who get to see this place. It really is becoming a much bigger effort a much bigger kind of thing that more people are knowing about whether it's because we see it on tv we hear about it in the news it's becoming a bigger issue beyond those boundaries that i would have kind of thought about perhaps 10 or 20 years ago like when i was setting out as a marine biologist i felt kind of different and weird for being the one who cared about what's down there what you don't generally see beneath the waterline but now that's really changing and i think so that for me is why I've got hope. And I think that the individual actions that we can all take is part of that bigger picture. Um, I, and I genuinely think what, what we need is to keep building on this, this army, this legion of people around the world who care about the ocean, who know that it matters what's down there, who know about the threats. And yes, we suffer from those kind of huge existential threat dreads of the big problems. But, but you know, through things like sea changes as well, it's this kind of, this this glimpse of all these people pulling in the same direction but in different ways in different places and all of those actions matter whether it's you know just as the simplest stuff even that can absolutely matter even if all you do is is to be informed and to ask questions and to learn and to talk about the ocean and to pass it on and to just to amplify this idea that this is an important place i think that still really matters um and every small action does i mean whether it's go out and clean your local beach that sense of community and connection that is a powerful thing and and nothing there's nothing wrong at all with so solving those local issues which are part of that bigger global issue too it's all pushing in the same direction so i think i don't think any any action is too small um and we can think big at the same time as we're kind of focusing on our, on ourselves if you like and on, on what's going on um so yeah i think there's, there's, there's lots to do. There's lots to do whether you focus on what you eat, whether you know look at this sort of issue of sustainability in fishing, and you are part of that. If you're a seafood consumer, that's part of what you can decide to do. You can decide to pay more attention to where your fish comes from, how it's caught, and support 
um, companies and, and initiatives that are making better choices for the seafoods that we eat. We know all about plastic pollution. That's almost the gateway entry issue for many people in the oceans, and that's absolutely fine. You know, get people in, get them to see what we're doing to the oceans, and then they care, and then they will do other things too, and they will go out and spread the word. Um, so I think it is, we've got this, this huge, this, there's not one single threat to the ocean, and there's no one single solution to that, the threats that the oceans face. And we need this rich ecosystem of, of people and, and just action and, and energy to, to, to push for all the different changes that we need to, to have the healthy ocean that we all want to share. So, yeah, I think it all adds up. I really do. I mean, yeah, I, but I, I think I'm quite sort of well informed about threats to the ocean and ocean conservation. But when I read chapter nine that it's entitled the eternal junkyard and i read this in horror and disbelief um, i was learning about dead livestock in their tens of thousands as a result of our desire for cheap meat abroad reading about radioactive debris from the apollo 13 mission reading about chemical weapons it seems to be that there's no end of what we throw into the oceans so i know you say that small scale things can really make a difference but i just felt so small when i was reading I felt really quite powerless that, you know, my little beach clean on my local beach or, you know, when I go diving, you know, just picking up the bits of plastic, I felt that was really just not enough. Is there, what more can we do? What pressure can we put on governments and, and, and mining companies to, to halt this? Yeah, so, no, you're right. You're, the, those big things are obviously there's you know it's a different scale for that kind of stuff and I should say about the dumping and, and pollution and stuff we, we are in a we're in a different place now in sense of it's not uh, it is illegal to kind of to deliberately dump a lot, um, most things in the ocean I think the the livestock stuff still happens um, so that again it's part of that question of well I mean should we be shipping live animals across the from the other side of the planet anyway and there's other you know there's ethical issues involved in that and I think I believe the UK is changing its policy towards that so that's something that's that's already hopefully going in the right direction um but obviously there's illegal dumping there's accidental dumping we've got things or, or pollution things like the does the deep water horizon oil spill was a you know, catastrophic example of what happens when when we're beginning to drill for oil in the deeper oceans um you know and uh, yeah it's a big issue but it's part of well we've got to change the way things are done we've got to disconnect ourselves from using oil because the reason we're not drilling for oil in deeper oceans is because the shallower um wells are you know they're running out um so we we've all got to kind of push towards being part of a society in which um things are done differently where we we don't just keep on the same old story of of this is what humans do we take resources we use them up and then we go and find some new ones and we get some more um same thing is happening at the moment with um i would say that the, the big kind of on, well, no, I was going to say on the horizon threat for the deep, but it's closer than ever now, especially this week. There's a lot of developments in the deep sea mining story. Um, it's now looking like this this new industry, which is going to open up the deep ocean to industrialization, to extract metals from rich ecosystems around the world, is going to happen potentially within two years um, because a few companies are planning to make a lot of money out of it, basically. They're telling us that it's a green agenda and that this is for the development of... Um, renewable um, technologies and electric car batteries and so forth but um, it's coming becoming fairly clear that actually beneath all of that is simply a, a profit motive and this is this is why this is happening this is the next way to make a bunch of money and the money is coming in from green investors who who want to invest in projects that are going to help save the planet and you can make it look like deep sea mining is going to help that but actually a lot of scientists are incredibly concerned about the impacts that's going to have so Go in, so what can we do? Um, there are some really fantastic organizations who are pushing very hard, specifically on the mining issue, but also other issues in the deep ocean. So go and check those guys out and support what they're doing. NGOs, there's the Oxygen Project, there's the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Both of them right now are collecting support, uh, putting some pressure on the United Nations, who are the ones deciding whether we should have actually go ahead with deep sea mining. And um, the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition are also working really hard towards that. And we are all part of this because this mining issue is an international thing. And, and most nation states are part of the United Nations body who are going to decide if mining should happen. Britain is one of them. The EU is another. We are all we should all be putting pressure on our decision makers to make the decisions that we want. Um, the EU Parli European Parliament recently came up 
in support of a moratorium on deep sea mining. It's putting out the right kind of messages and we need to amplify that and show that there are more and more people who are behind the idea of saying, now is not the time for us to start basically industrializing the final frontier on the planet, which is the deep ocean. Um, and this is happening right now. So I would say, go and check out those organizations. Um, Put your name to any kind of efforts that they're putting forward. Listen to the stories in the news. Talk to people. Put pressure on your on your MPs. They, are, they have got to go make decisions on behalf of the rest of us. And because, incidentally, the deep ocean, the seabed in the deep ocean, in the high seas, out there beyond any boundaries of nations, belongs to us all. It's actually technically the uh, common heritage of humanity, which is uh, a, a strange law that was put in place um, several decades ago, but it basically means that no one owns the, this part of the seabed and, and everyone should benefit from what's down there. And I don't think that, and that doesn't just mean the financial riches down there, but everything else that we get to, this, this sort of the healthy ocean and healthy planet that's uh, supported by a healthy deep ocean all the way through. So, um, so yeah, I would say go and find out, go and read. There's a whole bunch of news stories right now in this, um, about deep sea mining and it's something that um, some important decisions are being made soon about and it needs as many people as possible to get their voices behind it. So on the subject of mining, um, we're gonna hear a, an extract from your book. Um, so yeah. I just wanna say actually how much I have been totally immersed, I'm part of the book in the last couple of weeks. I, um, I actually been listening to this on Audible um, and I know actually you had a, an unusual way of recording this, is that right? <laughs> right, yeah. I just recorded it across here in, the, in this room. Um, I set up a kind of basically a sort of duvet tent, um, an audio, very high quality um, audio recording studio because everything had to be done at home. There were no uh, pandemic meant we weren't allowed to go into any recording studio. So I was at home um, and there we go. I sat reading my book out to myself for many, many hours. <laughs> it's an interesting experience for any writers out there. I would definitely recommend uh, reading the audio books of your stuff because you really get to know your work when you're reading it out all of it um so <laughs> on audible you have to imagine helen with a duvet over her head just, just um, sitting under the duvet just on your own as well with no direction no editor no producer <laughs> so that's a bit of a challenge and then occasionally having to stop because the delivery drivers were a bit noisy out. i can i always heard sounds i'm not sure if it came up on the mic but i was like oh need to stop it, it was perfect the door's just gone, someone's knocking the door. I mean, it's just pandemic life really, isn't it? I'm sure, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's had to figure out domestic uh, recording situations. Um, but um, um, yeah, could you, could you, you've got a, an extract about the deep sea nodules. Um, yes, explain. so I could, yeah, shall I, shall I dive into that? So um, it's, uh, so this idea of what we might be mining from the deep ocean, the, the big interest right now are these, these rocky nodules, basically they look like lumps of coal that are lying scattered across the abyssal plains in huge areas of the ocean. And in particular, one place that is potentially gonna be the first place to be mined is in the middle of the Pacific is an area called the Clarion Clipperton zone, the CCZ, CCZ as um, people call it. And, um, and I remember hearing about this um, place when I was at high school back in many years ago, when I was in chemistry classes and I was talk told about manganese nodules and how these were lying around in the deep sea and how they were full of metals um, and maybe one day they'll be mined. And at that point, no, it didn't really seem like it would matter because um, as far as we knew and as far as I was told at school, it was basically mud and rocks and that was it. So why not just go and pick these 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 rocks up that have got metals in them? And, and at the moment, we're being told that these are the metals we need to build car batteries and so forth. Um, but the, the slight hitch is that it's not just modern rocks. And as scientists are going more to this particular area, we're finding out more about the incredible ecosystem that is down there in this zone. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about uh, what you can find if you go and look at these nodule fields. Shrimp, sea cucumbers, brittle stars, and starfish roam around the nodule fields. Fish and octopuses swim by. Especially common and diverse in the CCZ are what look like sculpted mud balls up to a hand span wide, which are in fact living things known as xenophyophores. The name which stems from Greek words meaning one who bears foreign bodies reflects the way these amoeba-like creatures construct themselves a shelter by gluing together grains of sediment. Dozens of new Xenophyophore species are being found in the CCZ, and while they're certainly weird looking, they form important oases of life in the abyss, creating microhabitats for worms, crustaceans, and other creatures that hunker down inside them. 
The nodules themselves create a place to live for all sorts of organisms. In all, between 60 and 70% of the animals living in the CCZ depend on the rocks, making them as vital to the abyssal ecosystems as trees are to forests. Tucked away in the holes and cracks are tiny things like nematode worms and tardigrades, the microscopic water bears that have survived being frozen, boiled and put in a vacuum of outer space, and they can also tolerate being crushed beneath kilometres of water. Studying the wildlife over vast areas of abyss is not easy. The CCZ is 4,000 kilometres from one end to the other, covering an area almost as big as Europe. Cataloguing the larger visible species has become the task of autonomous underwater vehicles which sent to fly over the abyss, taking millions of photographs. Generally, there is an animal in view in every two or three photographs, the equivalent of an individual occupying each pool table sized area of seabed. One gummy squirrel, one, sea, um, one coral, sorry, one gummy squirrel sea cucumber. I can tell you what those are in a second. Uh, one coral, one anemone. Life is relatively sparse in the nodule fields, but across this vast region of abyssal plain, the numbers soon add up. The CCZ's diversity in species of megafauna, animals bigger than about a centimeter, is among the highest across the deep sea. Um, those gummy squirrels are basically sea cucumbers that are bright yellow. And they have this amazing kind of tail thing at the back of them, which you don't really know what does, <clears throat> but it does look a bit like a squirrel. And they look like they're kind of those sort of gummy sweets, like you want to chew like wine gums. Um, and I did go to visit a collection of these and I was asked if that might be what would happen if I tried to do that. And I was told not to do that because they're full of these nasty, well, basically kind of little spiky spicules inside these sea cucumbers. Um, uh, so not a good idea, but they look quite tasty. Like you want to give them a chew, mm, they look quite nice. <laughs> What do I love about your writing? Is it just you just bring the whole deep sea alive? I feel like I'm a diver. I'm underwater, looking at what you're looking at. You have an incredible way of describing exactly what it feels to be a diver underwater. Um, you've had some rave reviews about the book. I have to say, um, the the new statesman said that it's hard to imagine a more timely or important book than *The Brilliant Abyss*. Carefully conceived and luminously written, it's certain to be a bestseller, which gives me hope that its urgent message might help save the world. Is did you know that you were writing the right book for this time? I mean, with all the, the, the as you say, the, all the sort of threats of deep sea mining, was that why you wrote this book now? Did you know that before you started or did you just want to write a book on the deep? So to be honest, I actually was going to originally just be a book about deep sea mining. That was my first thought because this was something, it's something that's been on the cards, I mean, seriously now for a few years. And, and every time I heard about this, plan to mine the deep sea I did I genuinely felt like someone had kicked me in the stomach when you hear about the sorts of ecosystems it's not just nodule fields with these slightly dispersed but really fascinating really important ecosystems but other places too underwater um, mountains seamounts covered in extraordinary life they're another target for mining and hydrothermal vents the place where we didn't know they existed until 40 years ago and they these extraordinary oases of life that are showing us a completely new way of living down in the deep ocean on these hot springs, these towering tall chimneys, completely powered by chemicals pouring out of the deep sea, cut off from sunlight. They're also a target for deep sea mining. So every time I heard about this as a plan, I just felt sick, physically sick that this is something that could happen. So I set out thinking I, um, that could be something I want to know more about, especially because there is this story that's being told a lot in the media that we need to mine the deep to have the metals to build the electric cars, to build the solar panels and so on. To, to have this um, transition to a green economy. And I just wanted to know if that was true, like what's, what is underlying that? Um, and so I thought, well, you know, one way of really digging into a subject is, is to write a book about it. So, so that was my way in. And then of course, at the same time, I also wanted to tell the story of the great wonders of the deep. So I think they kind of came together with me. Um, what I couldn't have predicted, though, is that the book would be coming out. I mean, the book comes out in America next week, and it's literally in the middle of this kind of just a media storm about um, about deep sea mining and what's happening and who's pushing it and why they're doing it. That I wouldn't have predicted. I mean, everyone's asking, you know, when is the deep sea mining going to happen? It's not happening yet. When is it going to be? And I've been to conferences. I've spoken to all sorts of people. And it's always, well, you know, for a long time, it was going to be a decade away. And then it kind of got smaller and smaller until it's like, well, maybe in the next few years. Well. As of today, 
if this goes through, this piece of legislation, this loophole in the legislation that's just been triggered um, to say that it will happen in two years. And that's too soon. What we're hearing from all of the deep sea scientists is that we just do not know the full impact of deep sea mining yet. And two years isn't going to be enough to find out that and to figure out if we can manage it in a way that's not going to just, just cause almost per pretty much permanent, certainly on human time scales, levels of damage to the deep. Two years is not enough for that. So I couldn't have predicted that. And I, you know, and it's all I can hope is that, that the book and just by talking about it, more people will know and will keep asking questions and pay attention to these stories that are coming out and as they're developing, see, see what happens and see how the international community um, reacts. I mean, it is, it's not a done deal by any means. It's portrayed as a done deal that this is definitely going to happen, but that isn't the case. There are means in which um, a moratorium could be brought in to say, let's just wait and, and do the science before the mines begin. Because it's our opportunity to get this right. If it turns out we really do genuinely have a way of mining the deep that isn't going to cause catastrophe, maybe, 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 maybe that will be what we should do. But we just don't know that at this point, and we need time to figure that out. And so we need to sort of hit the pause button um, and, and, and let the science happen properly. How do you push for time like that? And how much time do you ask for, though? Is five years enough? Is 10? Surely no time is enough. I mean, you actually say, again, you know, you, there are places that are special enough to leave alone, and one of those is the deep. You compare it to Antarctica, you say it's this, this pristine wilderness that we just need to leave alone. But do we have the power, do any of us have enough power to say, actually, stop, don't, don't do it at all, don't do it in two years or five years or mm. ten years? I mean, yes, it could be. I mean, that's the st stance I personally take, which is that we, we don't need to do this. And we could just, we could make a, a, an agreement as like the Antarctic Treaty. I mean, that was an extraordinary sign of what humans can achieve to protect this planet if they want to. This was agreed 60 years ago this year is the anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty. And originally 12 nations in the middle of the Cold War who were fighting over who had territories in Antarctica, very similar ideas to sort of who's, who claims the resources of the high seas. Um, and they all agreed to set that all aside and make Antarctica a continent devoted to peace and science. I mean, how wonderful does that sound now? 60 years later, it's still in force. And as a part of that, there was a mining moratorium. There are mineral riches in Antarctica. They might be at the moment difficult to get to. Climate change is probably going to change that. And we can potentially, that's going to open up new resources. Um, but there was an agreement. There was an agreement to say, no, nope, we don't do that. Um, it's taking place on the international stage. The United Nations is the, the organization that oversees the seabed. So there is, a, there is a single body. The International Seabed Authority is in charge of looking after the single biggest space on our planet. More than half of the planet is the deep ocean, the seabed. They have it within their power to say no, because they're the ones who will say, here's your mining permit, which is what could happen in two years time if this all plays out. But the International Seabed Authority is made up of member states. The countries that are part of that are going to vote for that. Um, so there is there is a mechanism in place for this to happen. We've also got other things happening with new legislation in the high seas, again at the United Nations. Um, so there is, the, you know, we have got the ability. What we need is the commitment from countries to step forward and say, now is not the time, just like we did with Antarctica. There are places that are too special and important and we can leave them alone. I, I think it could happen. I have to have some hope that it will at least. It, it, there is a there is a way for it to happen and we could push towards that. You also say in the book um, that the, the shallow seas need the deep. We all need the deep. It's all water that's connected. If, if we look after the shallow seas, then, then we don't need to go to the deep sea to fish. I don't know if we need to go to the deep sea to mine. Is that, is that statement really true, that we can actually just leave the deep alone? We've actually got enough waters that we can not exploit, but we can harvest? Yeah, I think I, I genuinely believe so. I think um, I certainly don't think we should be fishing the deep, the deep sea until we've figured out the shallows. You know, this idea of sustainable fishing is it's it's doable. We know the science behind it. The science is not in question. It's the it's the politics and the economics behind making that happen. Um, and it is starting to happen in the shallow seas. We are we have got fisheries that are doing great, uh, making great strides in terms of, of, of getting rid of the really most damaging types of fishing gear, um, setting limits and, and figuring out what's a sustainable catch for particular species. 
Um, but we still have an awfully long way to go. And I think we should fix that first before even beginning to think about doing any more damage to deep sea ecosystems. We've had some really devastating deep sea fisheries. Um, some of them already been kind of curb, um, brought back. I mean, the, there's a limit, depth limit for fishing in the European um, seas, for example. I think it's 900 meters. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I genuinely think if we want to feed ourselves, there are ways of feeding ourselves from the shallow seas that it will be genuinely sustainable. It will need carefully doing particular species, farming of seaweeds and shellfish that are going to help even pull carbon out of the atmosphere at the same time, help clean up nutrients, things like that. Um, there are ways to do it, but we have to figure that out. Um, and, and with mining, well, that's going to be a whole issue with figuring out land-based mining, but also circular economies, you know, figuring out how to re properly reuse the minerals and metals that we already have and changing the way that things are made and manufactured and a whole kind of change to our attitudes towards um, consumption and production of, 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 of all the sorts of things we think we need. Um, and that doesn't have to have anything to do with the deep ocean as well. I think we've got a lot to fix out here um, that's going to benefit the deep as well if we can, if we can just just see through the science and see through what you know what we need to be doing to solve all of those big problems of climate change and um, feeding ourselves and all those things perfect thank you and um, well we've been talking for nearly an hour now um so and we've got some quite interesting questions that have come up um on the, the um, q a so actually if we could just go to some of those one of those is is really relevant now um, so I don't, I'm afraid, I don't know who these are all from, but Dr. Scales, you've talked about the role of the International Seabed Authority in monitoring the deep waters in this book. Do you think it's a reliable organisation for the welfare of the deep ecosystem or can it uh, succumb to commercial interest to exploit the deep sea? Is it a reliable organisation? Because you hint in, in your book that maybe it isn't. Yes. So um, there's only so much that I can say at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, what I would say, though, I would genuinely say to if you, any of you, and I hope you are interested in what's happening at the moment and in terms of the plans for mining the deep ocean, just keep an eye on the news and listen and, and look out. I'll be tweeting about it. <laughs> um, there are interesting things happening. Um, I, I, what I, what I will say is that the International Seabed Authority has a dual mandate, and that's a very difficult one for them to balance, and they do have to figure this out. Um, yes, they are responsible for the exploitation of the deep sea, but they were invented, it was an organization put in place um, in the early 90s. Um, and yeah, one part of why they exist is to oversee mining in the deep sea. Um, but they also have, they are bound by United Nations law to protect the deep ocean from substantial harm as well and deep ecosystems and species. And they absolutely have to abide by both of those and take them both, and take this very seriously. So the pressure needs to be on, I think, to to have the officials at the ISA, the International Seabed Authority and the members of that <coughs> organization to really take seriously that part of why they exist. Um, you know, I've, I've been in meetings where they really focus on the exploitation side of things and they're sort of existentially. That's why they're here, that we exist to mine. It's not necessarily the case. Um, things do need to ch change. A lot of what the decisions are being made behind closed doors, there's a lot of transparency that's needed in the sorts of discussions that are taking place. So there are changes that need to happen. Um, so I would say I'm, I'm not at this point, I think there are problems that need to be addressed. Um, for, I mean, for example, the, the, the secretary of the ISA has come out um, there's a guy called Michael Lodge is in charge at the moment, and he's come out on the record to being very pro mining. Um, and that's that's not controversial. It's in print. It's in the press. He's he's uh, appeared in the um, commercials, um, promotional videos for some of the major mining companies. So there's there's clearly the, the organization is being led from that perspective. Um, and I would just have to say we have to keep reminding them that that is not the only reason they exist and they absolutely have to um, take very seriously that protection that, that they are they are the stewards on behalf of all of us of the deep ocean um, and that that needs to be taken very seriously okay right i'm going to move on to the next one then um can we expect a station like iss in this in in space in the deep water as well for the research of the deep sea so i didn't read that very well but could could something like iss exist at the bottom of the sea um, it's a lovely idea. And actually recently, um, I don't know, you should go and have a listen to, I'm, I'm, I co-host a podcast called Catch Our Drift, and we had an episode recently um, where we interviewed um, uh, one of the Cousteau's uh, grandson, I think, of uh, Jacques Cousteau, um, 
uh, Fabien Cousteau, who has this plan, actually, he calls it the ISA, ISS for the deep ocean. I'm not quite, he is talking about fairly deep, maybe not deep, deep abyssal miles down, but the idea of having a kind of network of research bases around the ocean and what that would um, allow us to do and how it would create excitement for our deep exploration, just like the ISS does up in space. And it's a, it's a really exciting idea. I mean, there's really not that much sort of permanent occupation of the deep uh, of the ocean at the moment. We really just visit. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been to the, the I think the one existing deep um, ocean base um, in Florida, which is at about 30 meters down and you get to go down for about a week and, and stay kind of saturated with gas and you um, you can do your research that way. But he's got a sort of big plan for lots more of those. So do go and have a listen to that. That's a, it's a fun episode. I think it's the space episode of Catch Our Drift. Um, and we talked to him about his plans for, yeah, just that. I've just written that down. I'm going to listen to that later. Thank <laughs> That's you. Good. Um, and another really interesting one, actually, is there is anyone planning deep sea tourism in the way that Musk and Brandon are planning space tourism? And if so, when can I go? <laughs> oh, no, sign me up. Isn't it brilliant? Um, to be honest, funnily enough, there was a few years ago, I think probably about five years ago now, there was almost like the equivalent race for the deep. And it was Branson and... Um, well, I don't know if it was Musk or if he was sort of on the scene at that point, but they were basically trying, they were all, they were, that's what they were trying to do was like to have the first kind of deep sea tourism sort of subs that you could take people down in. Mm. As far as I know, it didn't really come to what they were hoping for. And then they all just went back up and looked at space again rather than into the deep sea. Um, so I don't think there is that um, so much. But there are, I mean, there are calls for that sort of thing. And there are more and more um, subs that will take people down to the sort of, you know, they're getting deeper and deeper. Um, I still th I don't think it's mainstream quite yet. So, but um, but one of my absolute heroes, Sylvia Earle, a wonderful um, oceanographer and marine biologist, um, American lady who's you know, been championing um, the oceans for for decades now. I mean, it's one thing that she she strongly supports this idea that if we can get people to be in the deep sea and to see the ocean more, then we can continue to kind of spread the word and c convince people that it's important and wonderful and it matters. Um, so I think she's all up for it. So we just need someone. We need Branson to stop worrying about space and do the deep stuff again. <laughs> people like you haven't managed to get down in a, in a submersible. How accessible could that really be? <laughs> I mean, it just seems ridiculous, really. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's true that, you know, it's, it's a, it's, there aren't that many truly deep subs. I mean, there's, there are more that can take you down to a few hundred metres. I mean, and that in itself would be wonderful. But to tr truly get down into kind of twilight zone, midnight zones, there's a handful of machines. I mean, it's it just, it's again, it kind of shows the, what we've got, what challenges we've got in terms of doing deep sea science. Imagine there were only, I mean, I think there's probably maybe five or six vehicles that can take people down in existence. Imagine there was only five or six, I don't know, jeeps that could take you into the rainforest and everyone had to share those. That was the only way to go to those places and to be there and study it. That would be the equivalent. And that's what we have now. Um, but I do think the remote stuff is, the remote research, it's, it's more accessible. It isn't as expensive. We can do more science, I think, with the remotely operated machines and autonomous vehicles and so on. So... But we do need people there too. I think we need that human connection. And that, you know, it's why we get so excited about people going into space. And I think we need that for the deep sea as well. So I think we still need to make that, you know, we need to put people there too, I think. Yeah. And is there any other way of encouraging people to sort of connect with the oceans? Um, you know, if it's if deep sea is really out of reach and, and just, just too expensive and too inaccessible. What other ways are there that we can encourage people just to connect? I mean, you did talk about, touched a little bit earlier with some of the Sea Changers projects actually really connecting people with the oceans, but are there other ways through maybe art and music and all that sort of thing? I mean, I know that you did, you did a book with um, the sculptor, the older Walter sculptor, Jason Takeris Taylor, mm. who does these incredible installations of life-size casts of real people. Um, and you can dive or amongst them or snorkel over the top of them. And I find that an incredible way of connecting with the ocean. And there's often a conservation message that comes through those as well. But are there, are there more examples of things like that that maybe we should be engaging with more? Yeah, I think we can engage, you know, from top to bottom, really. I mean, some of the deep sea stuff that I find really wonderful. And right now there's an expedition going on. The Schmidt Institute has got um, live uh, online footage coming up from their deep sea um, <laughs> research um, expedition i think they're in the pacific somewhere at the moment and you can basically go onto youtube and watch live basically live deep sea exploration going on and you can hear the scientists talking to each other i think you can ask some questions it's just really cool so it's like you know you're all, it's almost like you're on the ship but you're not quite so there are ways of kind of getting that getting your eyes in the deep i think the better you know the technologies are, are opening up the deep like never before but you know i guess looping back to this whole like reason why i got into this in the first place of, of 
of getting myself into the ocean and, and being by the coast. There's, there's nothing like that personal connection. Um, and and yeah, I think, I mean, again, I think it's what C <coughs> does so well, as we've said, is like, it's all the different ways that you can get involved. I mean, yeah, Jason's sculptures are an extraordinary way of putting art in the ocean and reminding us that we're part of this huge ecosystem. Um, and and I just think there's so I mean I'm sort of struggling to pin down other specific examples, but just any way in which um, you know you can have people going there, being there, feeling like they're making some difference, looking and learning. I think that for me, I, I certainly find I've always found um, for myself and also for other people I've dived with or taken rock pooling and things with. I mean, a good friend of mine is Heather Butevant in, in Cornwall, and she she takes people off and they go. She shows them what you can find when you look under rocks in rock pools, and they like so many amazing species. And learning and learning to recognise it, being the equivalent of a bird watcher for coasts and for rock pools and um, and for, for those shallow seas that we can get to. It's that's a really wonderful thing too. And like I'm I'm an absolute nerd with like I write down every species I see. I'm kind of, you know, I'm the list keeper. <laughs> you should see my list from France. I mean, that's one of the things I spend my time doing is trying to find new sea, sea creatures and and how many times have I seen them this year and things like that. You know, and that I find is a it's a nerdy but a wonderful way of opening up when you're looking and learning the names of things as well. Um so whatever go whatever is your thing, if you're if you're yeah, if you're into art, look at you know, look for things like Jason's work. If you're um into music, I'm going to hopefully take part in a, um, a, a festival later on in the year in Oxford, and it's going to be sort of the, the sound, the, the music of the ocean and the, and the words, the lyrics of Rachel Carson are going to be put to, um, to some fantastic new com compositions. Um, there's so many ways to link this in to sort of show that the ocean's come into all different aspects of our lives. I mean, go and have a listen to our um, Catch Our Drift podcast too. Each episode, we're trying to show that the ocean's come into our lives in ways that you might not think of. I mean, there's food, that's fairly obvious, but we've talked about music, we've talked about space, um, so many different, un perhaps unexpected connections that you can find and, and follow as well. So go and have a listen to those, you might get some ideas too. At the beginning of that answer, you mentioned where we could see footage, live footage from yes. commercials. Where, where was that again, please? So the Schmidt Institute, I, w I have been tweeting about it and I can carry on doing so. Find me at Helen Scales on Twitter if you're on Twitter. Um, but it's, it's uh, I think if you searched on YouTube for Schmidt um, with a C-H-M-I-D-T, I think, is how you spell it? Um, um, they have one, I think. Also check out... Um, Okeanos with a K. They will have some expeditions coming up. There's at the back of my book, basically, there's a couple of resources, including these guys who have um, live link ups when they've got expeditions um, and they they just do brilliant stuff for those sorts of things. Um, yeah. Let me just remind myself. Uh, yes. Okeanos Explorer, Ocean Exploration Trust, Nautilus, they do some too. The Schmidt, here we go, I've written it down. <laughs> it's it's S-C-H-M-I-D-T, the Schmidt Ocean Institute. They're out there right now. Um, and they all, yeah, whenever anyone's doing these expeditions, they 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 have these amazing live pros. The thing is that these dives last all day as well. Like I kind of log in in the morning, see what they're doing, go about other things I have to do and come back and they're still there. That's how huge and wonderful the deep ocean is. They're down there for hours, 12 hours at a time. <laughs> Brilliant, right, just a couple more. Um, can you give advice to someone who wants to get involved in the world of marine biology and conservation, who had a degree in biology, graduated in 2002 and retrained, doesn't live by the coast and has to balance the commitments that come with a young family? Crikey. <laughs> Maybe I'll hand that over to you Amanda, as well. But I mean, I would say this. Just, just advice about how to get into the world of marine biology. I get all the time, but you know, I, I just sort of dip my toe in here and there. But mm. you in that world what would what would you encourage somebody to do if they wanted to be a marine, marine biologist is yeah. it becoming a diver and studying marine biology at university or is there much more to it than that not necessarily i mean you certainly don't even have to be a diver to be a marine biologist that's not necessarily part of the job um description if it wants if you want it to be then then do that absolutely and um, get yourself qualified and get some experience and um, one port of call which is really useful and simple i think is to go to the marine biological association they're based down in plymouth go to their website they have fantastic resources and wonderful membership schemes no matter who you are whether you're um they have a young marine biologist program which is fantastic for um for the younger ones who are thinking that this might be something for them um, and they have fantastic um, uh, conferences and all sorts of things aimed at those guys. They've got student based program, they've got um, professional programs and they've got um, associate membership too for just even 
people who are just passionate about marine science um, and don't really have any um, idea of going into it as a job, but they've got ways in which to connect to you as well. So whatever you're sort of interested in, whether you want a professional interest, non-professional, or just um, you know, getting your kids involved, go and check those guys out. They're fantastic. They've got wonderful resources, brilliant, brilliant communications team. Um, and I think they'll kind of have a lot of ideas as well to set you off. In, on down those different paths of exploring the oceans in different ways. So that for me is like a one-stop place to go um, and get more ideas. Um, you certainly don't have to have all the degrees that I have. I have a stupid number of degrees. That's just because I was <laughs> very lucky and very nerdy and wanted to keep on studying. I mean, what counts a lot in a lot of jobs for marine, in marine science and marine conservation is experience um, and getting that in any ways you can is, is more important. But yeah, go to the MBA check out what those guys have to do um, and what they've got to say. And uh, I think that's a brilliant place to start. And how do you go about getting experience though? If you've not got a degree, for example, or you've never worked in marine conservation, is it all about volunteering? The volunteering thing's got quite tricky. I mean, when I started out, I did do some volunteering projects and it's become quite an industry now. And I'd say be quite cautious if that's what you want to do in terms of how much money you'd be paying and what experience you were going to have. There's a lot of organisations that are offering some of them genuinely wonderful, you know, opportunities to get into the ocean, to go to fantastic places. And um, I would also say, I mean, it is a difficult thing if you live in Cambridge like me, you know, near the ocean to get that kind of um, experience. But things like the Wildlife Trust, they have volunteer programmes within Britain. Um, you know, shorter term things you can go and get involved in, perhaps training courses that can get you um, up to speed on particular groups of organisms. If you're like me, you want to know what the names are, things like that, and which again is a skill that you can have. So that, you know, there are definitely um, UK based opportunities. You don't necessarily have to go tagging turtles um, in Indonesia to, to get that necessary experience. And because so much of that is, is available now, it, 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 it kind of, it's not going to make you necessarily stand out in terms of your CV. It's going to be a wonderful experience for you. Um, you may have to pay quite a bit for it as well, which I, I have a bit of a problem with. Um, if you can find genuine volunteering um, opportunities where you're not just paying, it's sort of it's more kind of eco tourism, and that's fine. Um, those sorts of opportunities are a little bit more tricky to come by. Again, I'd point you towards the MBA. I'd point you towards the Wildlife Trusts. Um, Marine Conservation Society, I mean, things like the great um, shark egg case hunt, so the Shark Trust do fantastic citizen science, project, science projects, um, wonderful ways to get youngsters involved and interested in, in, in the science and the biology of the coasts, but also an opportunity to get yourself as well kind of trained up and just try things out. You never know what it is that you, particular part of the science or conservation that you might you know might want to get more involved in and um, in Cambridge though there's loads of there's a lot of conservation organizations and a lot of job opportunities um, and probably quite a lot of voluntary stuff as well and um, specifically in Cambridge check out the Cambridge Conservation Forum and um, they've got a great website and lots of resources in terms of jobs and openings and opportunities here um, and some of them will be marine based as well so have a look at that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and just one more question. Somebody has written in asking what the cutest deep sea creature you've ever come across is. Now I was looking in your book and none of these look very cute. Oh. Uh, bizarre and weird. I suppose cute's not often the word. I mean, I don't know. My, I would argue that this, that is, do you not think that the scaly foot snails are pretty cute? <laughs> I don't think snails and cute don't really go together in my head. But yes, their feet are covered in scales. They're not slimy, which is the thing I don't like about snails very much is the slime. <laughs> um, I would say there's a lot of very beautiful, very, very stunning, beautiful things in the deep sea. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue for the Yeti crab, actually. Go on, can you read? Is it, did you have an extract that you were going to read about Yeti crabs? I can, I can do you a quick Yeti crab. Sure. I? Let me see. Yeah, the Yeti crabs are, are wonderful things. Okay. When Yeti crabs were discovered... It would have been poetic if it had been found that they eat marine snow. In fact, they do something even stranger. These abominable crustaceans were first seen in 2005 during a deep sea research cruise in the eastern Pacific, south of Easter Island. They're pale coloured with a thumb sized body and long front claws covered in luxuriant bristly extensions of their shells called CETA. Tipped with a pair of goofy looking rounded pincers, these pelts of blonde fur give the animal the look of a deep sea crab that might appear on the Muppet Show. I think they're pretty cute. Think about your descriptions, they just make you smile. I'm just there. I've got a, such a vivid uh, picture of a yeti crab in my in my head now. So. <laughs> 
thank you. Thank you very much. Really lovely way of, of ending our conversation this evening, Helen. Thank you so much for taking us on this fascinating journey into your world of the brilliant abyss. And thank you for all your energy, your passion, your tenacity when you're tackling issues, these massive issues facing the uh, marine environment persuading politicians and mining companies to protect it, even perhaps to leave it alone. You are an inspiration to us all. Um, and for everybody out there who's watching, um, you can follow Helen on social media. Please go and buy the book. Um, and if you do listen to it on Audible, just imagine her sitting underneath her. <laughs> Honestly, you'll never listen to it again without thinking about that. Um, thanks very much to everybody who's joined us this evening instead of watching uh, the tennis. Um, thank you for your support for Sea Changers. If you'd like to make a donation um, to their work, please just visit the, the Just Giving page um, and or visit the uh, merchandise page to, um, to uh, purchase t-shirts and hoodies. All that money goes to the valuable work of Sea Changers. And here's to the next decade of Sea Changers, supporting practical action like beach cleaning, but also educational activity, scientific research, making a real difference in the marine environment. Thank you, Helen, and thank you very much everybody for joining us this evening. Thanks everyone.